Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending this session today. Uh, my name is Scott Goodspeed, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, financing your degree, but I'll also give you a overview of the of the program. Before I uh, get into the agenda, let me just give you my background. I um, graduated uh, with a traditional MHA degree in 1980, and then for the next 23 years, I was the president and CEO of four different healthcare organizations, and uh, three were nonprofit. Uh, uh, one was for profit, and they were all my favorites. But I think one of my most favorites was Connecticut Children's Medical Center, where I um, moved down to Connecticut and merged and consolidated three organizations uh, into, into a new academic medical center and also created one faculty. Uh, practice plan and we would do just about anything to prevent a childhood injury and to save a, a child's life. After that, uh, after that 23 years or so, I, I decided I was going to go back and get my doctorate at the Medical University of South Carolina and had a research uh, um, grant for modern healthcare and a governance institute and ended up writing a book on uh, board of trustees best practices. Uh, at the same time, I spent the next 13 years or so uh, consulting with healthcare clients across the uh, <clears throat> the United States. And then about four and a half years ago, I got a call from one of the deans at uh, Brown University, and, and she asked if I would come and uh, interview for the uh, program uh, director position, which I did. So, um, so I've been here a little more than... Uh, four years, my academic appointment is uh, within the School of Public Health as a professor of the uh, of the practice. So that's a little bit about me. So let me just share a little bit about the program. But one of the important things that I'd like to do is at the uh, at the end of the session, I'm gonna try, try to leave five, uh, six, seven minutes is, if you've got questions, you can enter them in the Q&A and then Susan uh, Coogan, who I'll introduce at the end, um, will read those questions. So here's my agenda for uh, for the uh, time together. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the program. I'm gonna share the curriculum. I want to talk about how you can finance your, your degree and what uh, options are available. I want to share with you a typical applicant profile. So this is a profile of the last three classes. So the average of the last three classes. I want to talk about the application process. Um, and then I'll come back and, uh, and we'll answer your, uh, your questions. So the, the Master of Science in Healthcare Leadership Program is a 16-month program. Um, it's a, it's a co combination of uh, five residential sessions. Uh, in between the residential sessions, you're in, working in the online space. And I'll show you kind of graphically what that, what that looks like. Um, um, the average uh, years of experience for a student is uh, 15 to 18 years. And, our academic partner is the Brown School of Public Health. <clears throat> Most of you um, either have seen or know of um, uh, the Dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Ashish Jha. He started a year ago in September. And with cohort eight, which is the current class, uh, we invited him in January to do a keynote, to do the welcome. Um, and so he did. He spoke to the class for about 45 minutes. Then they had uh, about 15 minutes of questions. He talked about um, all of the challenges uh, we're facing in um, healthcare from a public health perspective. He shared his thoughts about uh, uh, the pandemic, um, uh, what was going on nationally, as well as what was going on globally. So, so academically, we're based in the Brown School of Public Health. So as I mentioned, it's a 16-month master's degree program for busy healthcare professionals. Um, about, a, about a third of the students who come in are practicing physicians. Um, half of those students are about seven or eight years out of residency or fellowship. Um, so they're at the beginning stages of their clinical career. And then the other half are typically uh, seven or eight years um, 
prior to retirement, and they're looking to go into a, a VP medical staff affairs kind of position, a VP quality. So, so they're looking for some type of leadership position. And the reason they come into the, into the program is to gain a new set of skills. Uh, we've got mid-level healthcare professionals um, who work in all various kinds of healthcare organizations who are looking for uh, greater leadership responsibilities. They want the benefit of an Ivy League education, um, and they're looking for the next career move. Um, we've got industry leaders, about 22% of our students from um, um, biomedical industry, uh, big pharma, um, the payer community. And again, uh, they're looking to advance their career either within their current organization or going to a new organization. And then we've got two other kinds of students. We've got high potential early careerists. So these are younger students with maybe three or four years of experience. They're um, in the 29 to 31 year age um, um, group. Uh, they're highly motivated um, to not only get their degree from Brown, but also to advance internally either in their organization or another organization. And then I always like to have uh, three or four uh, behavioral health professionals. Um, that was beneficial to the class, uh, to the students and faculty during the opioid crisis. Uh, that was very beneficial during the uh, the pandemic over the last uh, 24 months. So, so when you begin to think about when you arrive your first day of class, um, you're going to introduce yourselves, of course, but just think of the diversity of the cohort and the backgrounds and the experiences um, that the students have. And, and one of the things we hear consistently from alumni and from the current students is one of the real strengths of the program is the diversity, background, skill uh, of the cohort. So let me just uh, uh, share a little bit of, um, about the program. Um, the low residency uh, aspect of the program really um, caters to your work life demands. Um, um, and so you're not here full time, but you're here during the five residential sessions and then you're in the online space. And oftentimes um, we call that of course, asynchronous learning, but that allows you to put participate and, and complete assignments, um, mainly when it's best for, uh, for you. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the curriculum. If you join us in January of 2022, the first, um, uh, first day you'll come in is Sunday, uh, that's January 30th. Uh, breakfast at 8.30 will be, um, you know, in our uh, sessions at, at nine o'clock, I will give you a little bit of a orientation to the program along with my academic director. And then you're gonna go um, in a brown shuttle up the hill um, and you're gonna have the opportunity, uh, what students have done at Brown for the last 254 years, you're gonna get to walk into campus through the Van Winkle gates and there'll be bagpipers. Uh, the current class will be there. Um, and then when you graduate 16 months later, uh, that Sunday of graduation, you're dressed up in your regalia and you're going to be walking uh, through the gates, going outside of Brown University, symbolically completing your education experience. But most importantly, knowing that you're part of a broad network of, of alumni, of faculty um, and close personal friends. So that first uh, residential session, you'll begin with health policy. Um, that will take you till about uh, uh, Wednesday morning, so midweek of the first week. Then you'll um, go right into strategic planning and value creation. Um, and you'll also have some leadership and professional development classes. Um, the second residential session, um, you'll have a, a, a different set of courses. Um, it's typically two courses start during a residential session. Um, but the, the, one of the things that uh, we pride ourselves in is every student comes in with a critical challenge project or a capstone project. Um, all of the courses have 10 modules. So you can, you can think of, of that as four uh, um, during a residential week, six are online, but what we call modules um, nine and 10, that those 
the faculty focus on your critical challenge projects. So for example, the healthcare policy faculty will, will engage you in a discussion about um, what are the healthcare policy issues um, as it relates to your capstone projects? What are the, what are the regulatory issues? Um, in financial decisions, Professor Coyne um, will ask you, what are the implications for investor funding? What's the impact of the income statement and the balance sheet on your, on your critical challenge project? So one of the things that you'll find is all of the coursework is gonna link directly to the capstone project. So let me just spend a couple of minutes talking about the, uh, the critical challenge project. When you submit an application, um, we'll give you a framework of thinking about your critical challenge project, but um, you identify a need within your organization. It could be a need within your community. Um, sometimes we'll get a, a national project. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll get a CCP as we call it, um, about a, uh, an international project. Um, as I mentioned, all of the coursework is going to apply to your critical challenge project, and it's going to be done in a way uh, where you're going to be collaborating with not only an advisor who will work with you during the 16 months, um, but you'll also have a, uh, um, a CCP panel, if you will. Um, you're going to have um, lots of work with your students in terms of presenting your critical challenge project in terms of a, um, a poster presents, uh, presentation session, in terms of an elevator pitch. And then, of course, you're going to be working with, um, uh, with faculty members. So these are just some sample projects I mentioned that um, you know, the Critical Challenge Project could have an um, international impact. So if you look at the second one here, it's a, uh, this was a imaging doctor, so a radiologist in India. Um, who came into the program and she told us that the leading cause of death um, for children in many of the villages is uh, dehydration and diarrhea. So she worked to develop a natural product that um, decreases the inc incidence and prevalence of those two things. Um, she had a control group and a study group, and she was so successful that she actually saw, um, of course, in the study group, a significant decrease in the incidence and prevalence of, um, of those childhood diseases that have significant impact. Um, we had another student who was from the Bahamas, but she lives in New York City, and she wanted to uh, work with the Ministry of Health in the Bahamas and distribute uh, telemedicine primarily in what she describes as the out islands. So she, she's at her critical challenge project presentation and finishes up and she turns to one of, the, uh, one of the members of her panel who was the prime minister of the Bahamas and said, Mr. Prime Minister, we've talked about this. Tell me what legislature, what the legislative, what legislatively has been approved um, to get this off the ground and the prime minister um, gave her a, a multi-million dollar figure. And then she said, what are, the, what are the dollars that will sustain it over time? So we know it's here to stay in the out islands. The prime minister answered that question. And, and I tell you the story because she came up to me at the uh, end of her presentation and she said, I'm so grateful to this program. I, I've got a new set of leadership skills, communication skills, Pre presentation skills. And she said, I remember as I was getting ready to present my critical challenge project, um, Scott, you brought a physician in who happened to be prior to medical school, a NBC News nightly anchor who wrote a book about 18 months ago on communication and presentation. And she said, I came into the program confident, but I'm leaving filled with, with um, confidence, um, you know, because of my 16 months at, uh, at Brown University. And I only mention that, um, that one story because that gets repeated. Student after student after student will come up to me after the presentation and say, boy, I really want to thank you. I want to thank my classmates. I want to thank the faculty um, because I just learned so much. And then the final one I'll, I'll mention, this was a student that came in who was worried about um, older patients um, getting lost, if you will, in um, his hospital emergency department. So he developed and implemented 
a geriatric emergency department care navigation program, which of course was, was helpful to those patients who are older, um, but more significant than, than perhaps that is he developed this in a way that it could be transported to any hospital emergency room in the United States where if they wanted access to this geriatric uh, care navigation program, in fact, they could, they could, uh, they could have it. Um, picture of uh, some of our, uh, our faculty who have been uh, with us since the, uh, the beginning of the program. They're uh, very well known nationally, internationally. Three of them, uh, about two years ago, wrote uh, a best-selling healthcare leadership book based on their experiences at, uh, at Brown. So let me just talk a, a little bit about um, um, how you can finance uh, um, your school. So I'm going to talk a little bit about scholarships. Uh, I'm going to talk about company sponsorship in the context of your, your critical challenge project. I'm going to speak to the issue of military benefits, specifically the, um, the post 9-11 GI Bill benefits, as well as the, uh, the Yellow Ribbon Program. I'll talk about some loan funding options, and then I'll talk about the uh, installment payment plan. So here's just a thought or an, I, an idea. Um, students come in with a critical challenge project that can benefit their organization. Um, we have executives that join us from, uh, from CVS, um, other very large healthcare organizations. And sometimes they'll propose a critical challenge project that is of interest to their organization. It could be um, a way of increasing quality, patient satisfaction, market share, um, improving operational performance. Um, and so they present that to their executive team. Um, so now their executive team gets a little bit of a sense that, that not only they, they come to learn a set of leadership skills, but there is a direct benefit to the organization um, through their critical challenge project. So a CCP, as we call it here, is a way of working with your organization to um, begin to try to secure some amount of, um, of funding. We're also proud to report that uh, when we, uh, we survey the alumni, uh, big, big percentage reported significant salary increases, promotion, and then promotion into the uh, into advanced, advanced leadership or into the C-suite. I'd say about 55% of the students before they graduate um, end up in a, in a promotion within their organization or will secure a new position outside of their organization. Let me just uh, talk a little bit about military and veterans benefits. Um, first is the, the post 9-11 GI Bill benefit. Uh, that was effective August 1 of 2020. Um, there's a, uh, a, a, a not only a, a stipend for books and supplies, but but there's a um, a twenty five thousand one hundred sixty two dollar annually go towards the cost of the uh, of the private tuition. Um, in addition to that, and a subset of the nine eleven GI um, bill benefit is the yellow ribbon program. Um, um, that basically prescribes that, that tuition fees will be uh, covered 100% uh, by a combination of the post 9-11 GI Bill, um, as well as the uh, Brown's Yellow Ribbon Scholarship. Um, so you can check your eligibility, um, a certificate of eligibility um, um, through the eBenefits Education page. Let me just talk about some of the uh, loan fund options. Um, First, I'll, I'll mention there is a Brown installment payment plan. So the, the, the Brown installment payment plan in, enables you, um, working with your families, to make interest-free monthly installment um, of, your, of your tuition um, and any required fees. Um, there are federal student loans that are available. There's a direct loan program that provides low interest loans uh, to qualify, qualifying students to help you pay your your um, educational expenses. Um, there are private uh, educational loans. 
Um, and most importantly, the uh, Office of Financial Aid has uh, staff that's available that can give you um, good advice about the options, what you may be eligible for. And you can see the contact uh, telephone number here as well as the, uh, the email. So I would reach out to, to them at the same time um, you're, you're filling out your application. So one of the things we like to talk about is, is the program a good fit for you? And you can see here's one of our, our recent, uh, recent classes in front of the Van Winkle Gates. So I mentioned the diversity of the, of the cohort coming in. Um, you all possess uh, lots of experience. Um, you all are coming in because you wanna make an impact um, in your organization, community, nationally or internationally. Um, but you also want a, to, a new set of skills and, and perspectives. Um, you also wanna engage with faculty um, within the program. Um, this year, we've got, I'd say about a third of the class that are reaching out to faculty in the School of Computer Sciences, um, the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, so you have that, those opportunities um, available. And again, but the, the, the biggest thing that we hear is students, because you're so busy, you just want a flexible learning format. <clears throat> so this is the average of the last um, three classes. We try to keep the cohorts under 30 students because that's good for the students and that's good for the faculty. But the average cohort size over the last three classes um, is a size of 21 students coming from 12 states. Students come um, from international locations too. Um, the female to male ratio for those three classes is 44% female, 56% male. Uh, cohort eight, which is the current class, it's a 50-50 uh, female to male ratio. Uh, about 63% of the students hold advanced degrees. Um, we have a number of students that come into the program. They've got a bachelor's degree and they don't have an advanced um, degree. Um, um, the average here is about 47% of the students are students of color for the current class, it's 50%. And again, as I mentioned earlier, students are coming in with about 18 years of professional work experience. Let me talk a little bit about uh, applying to the program. Um, so there's a application and there's an application fee. Um, some of the components of that application include a, a personal statement. Um, I'm very interested in how you found Brown, um, um, what you expect to learn and, and receive out of this, uh, this education experience. Um, what you think you will contribute to the faculty and the students, because I think that's just as, as important. And I'm also interested in, in how you got into healthcare in general. <clears throat> um, there's also a part of the application where we want you to talk about your critical challenge project. Um, that's something that, uh, that is important to you and your organization. Um, I'm interested in um, why is this a challenge? Um, what are the constraints and what are the barriers um, that you may face working through this, this particular capstone project? Um, what are the project outcomes? What do you expect to achieve um, by the time you graduate? Um, sometimes a student um, um, after they graduate will, will write a, um, a peer reviewed uh, journal article um, your capstone project could be a strategic plan, it could be a business plan, it could be a white paper. So they all take different forms. Uh, we're looking for three letters of recommendation. One should be from a direct report. Uh, we would like to see a copy of your resume or curriculum vitae. Um, and in the interim, we can accept unofficial transcripts, but uh, before you, uh, you, you come um, and attend the program, uh, we require official transcripts. We don't require a GRE or a GMAT. So once we have a complete application, um, Susan Coogan, who um, I'll give you her contact information, um, will set up a admission interview. That interview is with me for an hour. Um, I've got two of those interview, two interviews today. Um, of that hour, 30 minutes is for me to ask questions about your personal statement, your CCP, um, your education, um, just generally try to get to know you um, better. But most importantly, 30 minutes is for you to ask me questions. 
Um, sometimes we'll go over the 30 minutes because it's important for uh, me to make sure that you're comfortable with the program, the faculty, the curriculum, and this is the best degree given your, your career goals. Um, we'll make an admission decision typically two to three weeks after the interview process. Um, you will, uh, we'll, you'll have a Zoom interview with me. I will make a recommendation to my academic director. We call that a second read. He doesn't have the benefit of, um, of the Zoom interview. Um, he and I will sit down and make a decision about do we admit um, or, or do we not admit. Um, and then you'll hear directly from uh, the graduate school. Once you hear from the graduate school that you got admitted, there's a non-refundable deposit. So applications are due November 1st. However, um, um, we accept applications on a rolling basis. And the sooner you get your application in, the sooner we can process that and get you a decision and get you a scholarship decision too. Um, and again, scholarships are, are dispersed on a first uh, come first serve. Um, and what could be up to 10% of, of tuition is fairly typical. These are the, uh, these are the, the dates. Um, so if you join us for cohort nine, um, the first residential session is January 30th to February 5th, 16 months later, May 27th to May 29th, 2023, um, you've got commencement or graduation. So with that, um, I'd love to answer your, your questions. Uh, um, Susan Coogan is a uh, program advisor. Um, she knows everything you need to know about the application and the scholarship process. Uh, so she can be a, an invaluable resource. Um, here's her contact information. Um, some of you have already talked to Susan and reached out, but um, I'd suggest you, uh, you get in touch with, uh, with her. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll ask Susan, if we've got uh, if we've got any questions, uh, yes, we do. Thank you, Scott, for a great presentation. Um, one of the questions that came in, uh, the student was asking if we offer electives in addition to the um, curriculum that you put up and and went over in great detail. But do students ever have the chance to take any electives if they were interested in it? Um, so the. Um, there are required courses. There are uh, full credit courses, half credit courses that are all required. And it's uh, the residential sessions and the online sessions um, are so busy. We act, there is not an option for um, elective courses. We've talked about that periodically, um, but that is not a, uh, that's not an option today. One of the things that I do do, which um, is, is a little bit interesting, is I'll invite a faculty member from outside of um, the healthcare program to come talk to the students. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, Dr. Shish Jha in the School of Public Health. Um, I think one of the um, one of the favorite faculty members that, that came in was uh, Professor James Head. Uh, Professor Head is a graduate of Brown, um, dual PhD. He invented with some postdoc students here at Brown the first Mars landing rover. Um, when the uh, when that landed on on Mars, he was in uh, at NASA with some of his researchers and with Carl Sagan from Cornell University. Anyway, I called him up and I had met him once before and asked if he'd come talk to the students for ninety minutes and and he did. And you could hear a pin drop. Um, he talked about the meaning of deep space, but then he talked about the leadership lessons. So so we'll do that kind of thing periodically. Wonderful, thank you. Students would like to know if there's flexibility on attending residential sessions. So the residential sessions are uh, mandatory. Um, we think that's, uh, um, that's good for the students as you come in and, and get to know each other. Um, you're going to be working in teams every residential and every online session. Um, the, the only flexibility we've had, of course, is in the last um, 18 to 24 months with COVID, um, um, there, are, there are two, if not three residential sessions, we had to go 100% remote. Um, so of course, during the pandemic, we're gonna make some, some adjustments, but generally the residential sessions are required. Okay. And then um, we also had a question from a student asking 
if they actually stay on campus or are they in hotels when they come for the residential sessions in Providence? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, um, our operations team will uh, work with um, the local Hampton Inn or um, um, another hotel, um, book a, a block of rooms where students can stay. It's at a fairly significant discount. Um, so we'll we'll give the students access to um, to hotel rooms that are within a couple of blocks of the uh, of a building. Uh, the other thing that we see students do is they'll rent a Airbnb. Um, and oftentimes students will do that during the five residential sessions. Um, um, they'll, they'll be in the same Airbnb. But the, the story is we had four students do that two years ago and um, they arrived and, and um, they said it was like staying at our grandmother's house because uh, the, the woman who owns there has um, you know, greeted them. Um, it sounds like had cookies and snacks every night on their, their pillows. So you, you have a range of options when you come on campus. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, one student also was asking about um, the CCP and how much access uh, they would have to their professors and their actual advisor um, on the CCP in terms of um, access and, and support. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a great cause. Um, <clears throat> um, when I interview you and we talk about your critical challenge project, I immediately begin to think about who an appropriate advisor would be. Um, um, I'll reach out to you before you start the program, and I'll have two or three suggestions. We'll chat, um, but that advisor. Um, is a paid um, advisor. So that person is there to, to work with you. Um, all the advisors are a little bit different. They structure their, um, their sessions with their advisees a little, bit, a little bit different, but that person is there full-time. I am the instructor of record for the Critical Challenge Project. So um, I will have uh, students that I will advise, but if students have questions along the way, because I'm the one that um, that sends out all the assignments, they certainly can come to me. Um, and then the faculty um, will always get in, involved. Um, I've got a student now um, um, who has a, a critical challenge project advisor. Um, he wanted uh, Judy Benkover, who is a PhD health economist, uh, who teaches in the program as part of uh, his panel. So he reached out to her and Judy, of course, said, uh, said yes, so you're going to have all kinds of of support um, for your uh, critical challenge project. Oh, one. And this is the last question. Um, the student is asking, what exactly um, will their diploma say in terms of um, the degree? So I, I'm smiling a little bit. So it's a um, your, your degree is is a Master of Science in Healthcare Leadership is the the uh, degree that's granted, but has been a tradition for 254 years. So when you ask me what your diploma says, um, I can tell you that's the degree name. That's the degree that's granted upon the student. Um, but your diploma, as is, is Brown tradition, is in Latin. So that's why I was smiling a little bit. So Susan, we're a little bit after. If that was, if you yes. have another question, I'm willing to take it, but. Um, no, that, that's it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for attending. Again, um, you know, I, I'd love to spend time with you, um, you know, in the context of your complete application. I'm always available to talk about the program outside of that, uh, that process. I just wanna also acknowledge that uh, for those of you who work um, direct patient care, um, indirect in a supportive way, the last 18 to 24 months have been very difficult. And I just wanna, tell you all how grateful we are for our, everything you've done, um, uh, caring for patients, whether that's directly or indirectly, or, or making a, a significant impact on your community, on policy. Um, so with that, again, I wanna thank you for attending and uh, everybody be well and be safe. Thank you.